Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit more of a personal introduction for Dr. Corey. I hope you don't mind. Um, we moved here two years ago from the Bay Area, and my son was seeing Dr. Gantman immediately and started the PEERS program. And Dr. Gantman highly recommended Dr. Corey to us for Josh's medication management. And Dr. Corey is our first psychiatrist that we've dealt with. Our first visit, in fact, was exactly two years ago today. So Dr. Corey is the founder of the Mund Health Institute, and he has an incredible education and extensive experience that you can read about. But as a parent, I'd like to highlight what's more important than that to me. We've seen him in both his Newport and Laguna Beach offices, as well as online. He's able to truly engage with my son, Josh, and get him to express himself, and that's not easy. He explains things to our family in a way we can understand. He listens to our concerns and is flexible when we wanna make changes. He understands and coordinates with all the information from Josh's pediatrician, therapist, and biomedical doctors. I highly recommend him and thank him so much for giving us his time this evening. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Corey. Thank you, Robin, that's very nice. Um, and you know, I wanted to just really kind of keep this lecture pretty pretty um, focused um, and not really get overly um, complex in how um, myself, at least as a psychiatrist, tries to approach and conceptualize uh, kind of as a whole autism spectrum issues and some of the thoughts that we go through when trying to make a determination about um, the appropriate treatment. And that includes kind of psychosocial treatments, AKA therapy um, and or um, medication management. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So the, as, as most of us know, and this is pretty basic, the, kind of, the concept of the autism spectrum um, has changed pretty significantly throughout the years. And most recently with the, the launch of DSM-5 in the early kind of around 2013, um, the APA um, again um, changed di the diagnostic structure. From my perspective, it wasn't overly significant. It didn't really change how we viewed things from a medication standpoint, but it did um, really change some of the, the details of, of the, the diagnostic structure. And, and one of the biggest changes was um, in the overall DSM was this, this concept of how we view ASD and, and the spectrum as a whole. Um, as most of us know, ASD is an umbrella diagnosis uh, for people who were previously diagnosed with a, a range of diagnoses, including autistic disorder, Asperger's, pervasive dis developmental disorder, NOS, sometimes called PDD NOS, and um, childhood disintegrative disorder. The intent of this change was really to standardize our nomenclature and to create a more accurate diagnostic criteria that really looks at symptoms and how those symptoms relate um, to treatments and other interventions. And like I said, from my perspective, a lot of the details of it change, but it really the, at least the concept of the spectrum that I learned in training um, now a little over 10 years, between 10 and 15 years ago, was really not all that different. So what is um, autism spectrum disorder? Really what we know about it is it's a neurobiological disorder. It presents in early childhood and it's really defined by two categories of symptoms. And those are persistent deficits in social communication and interaction. And then also this was kind of part of one of the changes is kind of restrictive repetitive patterns of behavior. And you know, this is kind of consistent with, like I said, what I was taught during my training in that 
when we really look at the spectrum, really what it is, is we have different developmental trajectories that kids and adolescents and young adults go through. We have communication trajectory. We have a fine motor trajectory. We have a gross motor trajectory. But really what defines the spectrum is really a delay in, in, in social communication and interaction. And really that at some level is what many of us consider the core issue of what autism is or what someone is on the, who's on the spectrum struggles with is really the concept of reciprocal communication, the concept of um, interacting and responding to nonverbal cues. We also do sometimes look at severity levels. And this is something that has some clinical significance, but also is kind of related to insurance reimbursement. And in this, this for ASD is defined by levels. It was level one is requiring support, level two is requiring substantial support, and level three is requiring very substantial support. So that those are kind of comments or, or those are kind of related to overall functioning. I, and and this, is, this is a concept that really is true throughout psychiatry and um, many of our um, conditions that we treat is we have two concepts that we pay attention to as symptoms and then also kind of functioning. And, and this is kind of the severity level really um, is more focused on overall functioning. What causes ASD? Really, this is no clear cause has really been identified. There's all kinds of theories as we know about a variety of things that likely play a, a part um, in, in, the, in the outcome that is ASD. There is some evidence that there are a kind of biological factors tend to be a little bit more significant than environmental factors. That being said, there are many bi uh, environmental factors that uh, we pay attention to as a field and that um, shouldn't be ignored. Um, there's also some pretty strong evidence for, for some um, genetic inputs. And then um, the lastly, there's not great evidence as most of us know for the role of vaccines. Um, there has been some data in the past that really did support the role of vaccines. A lot of that, um, those studies have kind of been refuted and um, in more recent studies have really, um, have really kind of shown that there, there's an unlikely major correlation between vaccines and ASD. Um, but as we all know, many, many people, um, their experience and what they kind of experience, they do feel like vaccines potentially play a role. Um, and then down in the right corner, I included a, um, a really kind of a, a, a cool graphic that I actually found on the internet. And it really just looks at several of the theories about what um, could contribute from environmental toxins and stressors to mitochondrial dysfunction, to uh, neuroinflammation, to oxidative stress, to the glutamate GABAergic imbalance, to hormones. And, and, and I really think this does a good job of really just saying that there are likely a multitude of inputs and a multitude of things that we should pay attention to. And um, ASD as a whole can be a really what we call a heterogeneous diagnosis is to um, young people or adults that have been diagnosed with autism or ASD can look very, very different. And in, in some ways, that's why function um, and things like that are so important to pay attention to. Um, I tend to work with a, a, a more people who have what a lot of people refer to as high functioning which often means they're, they're just quite verbal. How is ASD diagnosed? You know, this has been something that it really 
is a clinical diagnosis. And really, like I said before, the core issue tends to um, be related to social and communication issues. But there are some kind of gold standard rating scales that exist. Um, the ADOS and ADIR are really the more um, academic or scientifically founded rating scales. The ADOS is a bit of a difficult evaluation, not, not from the patient's perspective, but from the clinician's perspective. And uh, clinicians need to be quite trained in knowing how to do this type of evaluation. The ADIR is more of a, a structured interview, which focuses on a lot of um, um, kind of developmental events around age three. Um, and then there's some other rating scales that really can be useful when it comes to um, quantifying functional impairment or quantifying symptoms. And the two most common are the CARS and the ASRS. What are treatment options? Um, I know I'm speaking to a lot of people right now that have a lot of experience with um, um, ASD and um, treatments, but this just kind of gives us a reminder of a um, the kind of some of the psychosocial interventions. And this ranges from individual therapy, which the most scientific evidence exists for ABA, um, to educational interventions. Um, to family interventions. Um, as you can see here, the educational interventions are kind of behavioral interventions at school, appropriate school placement, uh, residential placement in limited situations. And that's really more for um, patients that tend to be fairly low functioning and uh, there's a lot of agitation and aggression. Um, here in Orange County, we do have some specialized schools um, that focus um, uh, largely on ASD. Um, the ones I can think of off the top of my head is uh, kind of New Vista. Um, I know Prentice often has a lot of kids on the spectrum, even though they were founded to focus on learning uh, disabilities. Um, and there are a lot of other kind of smaller um, and kind of um, I don't want to stay upstart schools, but just like smaller um, environments that can often be um, appropriate considerations as well. When it comes to family interventions, we really kind of look mostly at behavioral interventions at home. So kind of at home behavioral therapy or um, really focusing on implementing a positive reinforcement system which sometimes I like to say that really can be helpful for anything. And the, the, the reason sometimes to do that is it really doesn't matter what the diagnosis is in our field, that if we're trying to change behavior, uh, positive reinforcement done well is the most effective way to do that. Um, like I said, I, I know most of you probably have some experience with ABA. But this is an intervention that's based on the science of learning and behavior to understand how behavior works, how behavior is affected by the environment and how it takes place. The goal of this type of therapy is to increase behaviors that are helpful or productive and decrease behaviors that are unhelpful or disruptive. And it really is based on the, the, the core behavioral model, which is like the ABCs of the, looking at the antecedents, the behaviors and the consequences. And that often modifying A and C can help change uh, behavior um, in a desired direction. You know, sometimes you'll hear the term of functional behavioral analysis too, um, which is really a, version of this that is really focuses more on a problematic behavior and tries to uh, delineate the antecedents to that behavior, the consequences of that behavior in an effort to really try to change um, uh, the behavior through a, a behavioral strategy like ABA. Um, positive reinforcement, um, I, again, like I said before, I think the reason that we always consider positive reinforcement because it really just is our best tried and true method to change behaviors um, for regardless of the diagnoses. Um, this is based on some kind of early um, of the kind of figurehead psychologists that really looked at um, this and, and one of them even trained 
pigeons how to play ping pong just really merely through positive reinforcement. So positive reinforcement is based on the behavioral principle that behaviors are reinforced or rewarded will increase. And then when a behavior is followed by a reward, the poor person is more likely to repeat that behavior, which encourages more positive behaviors or skills, skill acquisition over time. Uh, this tends to lead to a more meaningful and lasting behavioral change. And um, this is really a strategy that can be implemented through behavioral charts uh, that focus on tracking behaviors and rewards. The challenge with this is it's hard to do and it's hard to be consistent. And um, especially when we're dealing with complicated or maladaptive behaviors, it's really hard for most of us parents to really focus um, on the consistency and implement the positive rewards in the right fashion um, to, to lead to change and, and have it last. Honestly, I talk to people all the time. I know this is a challenge for my, my wife and I when we're trying to do this, is it's just really challenging to be consistent. Sometimes I joke, it's really hard to be in, consistent with myself as a parent um, and, and just handle things consistently. And then between two parents who have uh, different experiences, different upbringings to really kind of come together and be um, consistent is really challenging. Um, and then sometimes you throw in there the layer of complexity that comes with parents who are separated or divorced and, and it becomes <laughs> next to impossible, unfortunately. Um, and it really is unfortunate because this does tend to be a, a type of therapy that really isn't overly complex um, and, and really can um, change behavior um, quite effectively. <clears throat> this is really the focus of the lecture, just um, because uh, being a psychiatrist, not that all we do is prescribe medications, but often what happens is people are referred to us from a therapist. And um, Dr. Gantman was mentioned earlier, who is a therapist that focuses mostly on um, um, kids and adolescents and young adults on the spectrum. So they're already general, often getting very good therapy. And, and a good therapist really can incorporate a lot of, if not all of the strategies that we mentioned, ABA, um, positive reinforcement, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, if and when needed. Um, but often when that therapy is limited um, or the success is limited, that's when um, individuals are referred to therapy. I tend to look at this and I use this construct when it comes to most things in our field, whether it's anxiety, depression, um, autism spectrum issues is usually if things are mild and manageable, we should start with behavioral interventions, at-home interventions, things that are appropriate, whether it's, um, this isn't necessarily specific to ASD, but whether it's meditation or exercise or eating well or getting enough sleep, kind of simple behavioral interventions. Um, when it kind of gets to the high level of moderate, mild and uh, manageable, that's when we could think about layering in therapy. Usually when we get to the moderate range, um, that's when we tend to have the best evidence for the combination of psychotherapy plus medication. And when things get into the severe range and are really impairing functioning or getting in the way of life uh, or daily activities, that's when we often consider medications. And like I said, I tend to use that pretty simple template for most things. It varies a little bit. There are things like ADHD that we have really a lot stronger evidence for medications than we do for psychosocial interventions, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's no role for psychosocial interventions. And so, like I said, I, I tend to use that kind of big picture concept when I'm uh, modeling most um, psychiatric or psychological issues. I, I tend to tell people all of us struggle with symptoms of depression, symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of irritability, 
And it really isn't until they get in the way of life or are functioning that we should consider labeling them and or treating them. One of the really kind of core concepts when it comes to ASD that there really are no medications to target the core symptoms. And those core symptoms have often been, I know earlier I said it was social and communication issues plus repetitive um, uh, behaviors. I generally think of the core symptoms as social and communication issues. And when it does come to repetitive behaviors, we do have some potential medications for those targets. So what we do in this area, we tend to call it the target symptom approach because we're not treating the core issue. There are, there are studies looking at things, um, um, interventions, medication or psychopharmacological interventions that are treating the core symptoms. None of them that I'm aware of to date have been overly effective. Um, but you have, you have studies looking at like oxytocin, which is kind of considered a feel-good hormone. You have studies looking at um, GABAergic or glutaminergic medications, which kind of makes sense because as I said earlier, that's one of the theories about one of the potential inputs to ASD. Um, so there are studies and there is certainly a, a, a fair bit of research going on to try to delineate some treatments for the core issues. Um, however, still to date, we really focus on the target symptom approach. And so these symptoms I listed here are really kind of the core symptoms that we often, they, that people with ASD often struggle with. And to be honest with you, these are issues that people with a range of psychiatric issues struggle with, from insomnia to irritability, to anxiety, to repetitive behaviors, impulsivity and or other ADHD symptoms, agitation and aggression, and mood liability. And so as you can see, shoot, I'm sorry. Let me try to go back. Um, as you can see, um, insomnia can be treated with sleep medications like mel melatonin or trazodone or sometimes other sedating medications like gabapentin or Seroquel. Gabapentin tends to be an anti-anxiety medication that can work for insomnia. Seroquel is an atypical antipsychotic that works for insomnia. Irritability, we often use SSRIs. Irritability tends to be a, a common symptom of depression in young people. And so that's kind of where that um, connection comes. Anxiety, SSRIs are the first line treatment. Uh, repetitive behaviors are kind of seen through the lens of obsessive compulsive disorder and SSRIs are the primary treatment for that. Impulsivity is kind of viewed through the lens of ADHD. And so oftentimes ADHD medications are used for that. Um, agitation and aggression. Um, in general, atypical antipsychotics are commonly used especially if someone's really at the point where it's difficult to maintain them in the home. That's often a, um, a, a significant threshold because if someone's gonna have to go to a residential because of agitation and aggression, it really does make sense to potentially try an atypical antipsychotic, which tends to just really kind of cool things down for most diagnoses in our field. However, a couple of them, Risperdal and Abilify, actually do have FDA indications for agitation and aggression related to the spectrum. Um, so it really is one of the few medications that, um, class of medications that has an FDA indication for this use. Other medications for agitation and aggression sometimes can be SSRIs or mood stabilizers. And then lastly, mood lability. Um, we often consider mood stabilizers or others. These last two, we put others because honestly, um, those are issues in our field. Agitation and aggression sometimes gets connected to psychosis, even though it's not solely a, a sequelae of that. And mood lability often gets pre, um, connected to bipolar. So um, the, the associated medications are the options that we often use for those diagnoses.
this is just another visual about what the, the target of sym uh, symptom approach can look like. So the social and communication issues tend to be the core. And then we have these kind of litany of uh, corollary or related symptoms, um, oftentimes that people on the spectrum ha all have these core issues, but then they may have insomnia, anxiety, and inattention. And so then we focus on those target symptoms or someone may have impulsivity, um, mood liability and agitation aggression. So I, I know this is kind of a simplified view of that, but it really kind of makes sense. And what I put as an SSRI is an example. So again, I know I just went through this, but anxiety, SSRIs, mood liability gets connected with mood stabilizers, inattention with ADHD medications, repetitive behaviors with OCD, which is also SSRIs, agitation and aggression, um, atypical antipsychotics, as I stated, have a, a FDA approval, um, insomnia, which we can use sleep medications, irritability, which gets connected to um, depression often and or anxiety, and then impulsivity, which just tends to be another, um, I, again, viewed through the lens of ADHD, you would, one may consider using ADHD medications. Just some final points, um, and, and this is something we always try to um, be mindful of, is kids with ASD tend to be more sensitive to medication side effects. And this may be because we're using medications that are targeting symptoms as opposed to a diagnosis, or it may be because, you know, one of the, the most prominent theories about this is when we're treating what are kind of sometimes referred to as organic issues, which really means that we know um, there's some kind of neurological component, uh, medications tend to be a little less um, effective and potentially have more side effects. So that's just something important to be mindful of. We tend to like to uh, start low and go slow. Um, Stimulants really are an appropriate consideration. It is often said, I've heard even other professionals say this, that because kids are more um, sensitive to medication side effects, that stimulants always are activating. That is not true. And in fact, stimulants can often be quite effective. Um, some drugs have multiple potential targets, and these include like Risperdal and Abilify, which are the atypical antipsychotics that I mentioned are FDA approved for agitation and aggression. They also can be used for uh, treatment refractory OCD. They can sometimes be used for treatment refractory depression. So there are some other targets. And as I mentioned before, SSRIs tend to have many targets, anxiety, depression, OCD, um, and things of that nature. Psychosocial interventions are underutilized. I see that all the time in my practice where people come and want to consider medications and have never really considered therapy. Um, I, I think that's a mistake in most cases. And, and we generally try to um, connect them with a good therapist. Um, sometimes, as you know, that's challenging just because of some of the systems issues with finding good therapists, especially um, good therapists um, that take insurance in situations where that is um, the preference. Um, the really only medications that are FDA indicated, as I've mentioned a couple of times, are Risperdal and Abilify. Their indication really is solely to the related agitation and aggression and uh, relatively low dosages are supported by the data. And why I mention that is because sometimes for Abilify up to 30 to 40 milligrams can be used for psychosis and or um, mania, but sometimes we're talking more in the two milligram range when it, uh, when it comes to using um, Abilify for um, the indications that we're talking about tonight. And this is just lastly, um, some resources and contact information for us. Um, our clinic puts out a lot of free educational material. Our goal through it really is to just get out their good 
mental health information. Um, as most of us know, it really is hard sometimes to find good information when we have the power of the internet and can really find anything we're looking for. And this is just a couple of the social media platforms we use to try to, to do that. Um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and then this is a newsletter um, that you can subscri subscribe to through either of those um, um, web portals. Um, and then obviously if anyone ever has any questions or um, needs help connecting with any resources, um, we do have an outreach arm of our clinic and someone who's actually kind of focuses on being an intake coordinator and community liaison. Her name's Andrea Janae, um, that you can always feel free um, to touch base with um, if um, you need to be connected to resources. Um, we are not a clinic that takes insurance, unfortunately, but we are always willing to try to help connect uh, people with um, um, in-network providers, um, sometimes providers at um, Kaiser or, uh, or other um, places. I, I just feel really strongly that it really um, is in everyone's best interest if they're connected with the best um, it through the best portal. So if someone has Kaiser insurance and really needs to stay in network in Kaiser, it really makes sense to facilitate the referral within the Kaiser system. Um, and if anyone ever wants any more information about that, we have a, a handout that we, we kind of call it portals of care, which really delineates the five or six uh, portals that you need to, to go through if you're interested in accessing Kaiser services, or county services, or private services, or in-network services, or um, some of the higher levels of care like an IOP or partial hospitalization or, or an inpatient hospital. All right, I hope that was helpful. Thank you very Thank much you for visiting us. Thank Come you. again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.